Is my microphone working? There we go. Okay. So this is a little bit of a shift from quantum computing and AI. We're going way back into the past to a time of slide rules and graph paper, and there were computers involved, but they were Honeywell computers with 32 kilobytes of memory. Uh, it's about problem solving on an epic scale and one of the greatest lies ever perpetrated on the world. So this is the book I wrote about an operation called Project Azorian, um, and it's an extremely complicated project. There's a lot, I mean, I could talk about it for hours. There'll be time for questions afterwards, but I'm just gonna take you, take you through it from from the beginning. Um, so, in the early hours of February 25th, 1968, the Soviet submarine K-129, pictured here, armed with three nuclear ballistic missiles, set sail from a base in Siberia on a routine combat patrol. Now, combat patrol didn't mean it was going to war. It was just what submarines did. The point of a nuclear deterrent was to not fight wars. Um, submarines were considered the most critical part of what we call the nuclear triad, the other two pieces being intercontinental ballistic missiles and bombers. Subs are the key, though, because in theory, that's the one thing you can hide from the enemy. And here we're talking about the United States, Soviet Union, East-West. Um, the cat and mouse game under the oceans between the US and the Soviet Union was arguably the most important, most expensive part of the Cold War, also the part we know the least about. Submarines are incredibly secret to this day. I, I don't know exactly what the rules are in the Soviet Union. In the United States, it's still illegal. to. We, we don't know when the subs are departing port, we don't know when they're coming back, we don't know when they're going. The crews are under highly classified statuses at all times. I mean, you can go to a port, the bases themselves are not secret. You can go to, to Connecticut, for instance, and watch a submarine go out, but you can't call the public information officer and say, when is the submarine leaving? Highly classified. So this is K-129. 98 men on board, it's diesel electric powered. Most of these guys are in their 20s, and it was one of the first combat, combat patrols of their lives. Two weeks into the mission, the sub disappears. It, routine, it failed to surface for a routine transmission. Again, because these are highly secret platforms, they don't communicate regularly. At certain times, they surface and radio back, say basically, I'm okay. This one doesn't do that. The Pacific fleet scrambles all hands. So planes, ships, submarines, everything possible. It's very obvious to the United States that the Soviets are looking for something. Um, and the US, of course, is watching. We keep a close eye on their ports, vice versa. So it's obvious that the Russians have lost something. It's pretty clear that it's a submarine, and it's probably the K-129. So using a combination of a highly secret network of seabed mounted hydrophones, um, this is known as SOSIS, and the US Air Force nuclear seismic test sensors, which are called AFTAC, these sit on the seafloor, and the purpose of the Navy version is to listen for submarines. Every submarine has a unique signature. It's some combination of the propeller, the engine, the way it creaks and groans. So these hydrophones listen for submarine activity. Each one has an independent signature, almost like a fingerprint. So the Navy's listening all the time. The Air Force has a secondary system of hydrophones that listen for the splashdown of ICBM heads because then what we know now, we didn't know then, is that the US Navy would then go and steal those. They weren't armed, of course, but what they did have was guidance on them. So you, the nose cones are extremely valuable. Washington asked the question, the Soviets lost the submarine. Could we find it? They did, here. So basically, they lo they're looking for anomalous acoustic sounds on the data. Well, they found what sounded like explosions, triangulated from a series of listening, series of listening stations and located it here, roughly 18040, more than 1,500 miles north and west of Pearl Harbor. So the US Navy sends an extremely secretive submarine called the USS Halibut. Its existence wasn't even known to the Soviets and most of the Americans at that point. It has to find the submarine. So you know basically where it is, but not exactly where it is. The halibut spends weeks towing a camera at the end of a 5,500 meter string in a very detailed grid pattern going back and forth for months until finally they find it. They take fairly accurate pictures. They find the submarine to be in remarkably good condition. And Washington decides, let's go get it. And that job was not given to the Navy, which is maybe a little strange sounding. The Navy, oceans is their specialty, right? It goes to the CIA. Specifically, a new directorate called the Director of Science and Technology. The decision was not without controversy. Even some people within the CIA thought it was crazy. The CIA director at the time, Richard Helm, was said to have exclaimed when he heard about it, but we're not a Navy. To which this man, appointed director of the program, John Perangoski, responded, we weren't an Air Force either, and yet, 
the CIA had built these remarkable machines. You might recognize one at the top, that's the SR-71 Blackbird, known as the A-12 when the CIA built it. Arguably the greatest plane ever built, especially when you consider the speed and secrecy under which it was developed. Um, it flew first in 1962. At lower left is the world's first spy satellite, Corona, which started taking pictures from space in 1959. First time humans launched something into space and recovered it. Um, only by 10 days, I think the Soviets got the dogs up 10 days later. Um, and lower right, U-2, still flying 64 years after its first flight at Groom Lake, better known as Area 51. The mission to recover the submarine was codenamed Project Azorian. It would become the largest and most expensive covert operation in history. Perhaps, I guess, the CIA does not, release, does not release official rankings. We have to assume that it was the most expensive. Certainly the most audacious when you hear the details. So this is a spoof later drawn by a cartoonist. It becomes the unofficial symbol for the program. So I don't know if, you, if the real CIA logo does not have flipper, scuba flippers or a scuba mask on it. <laughs> it does have an eagle. <laughs> Um, interestingly, last year was the 50th anniversary of the Director of Science and Technology. They made a time capsule. They put in one object from each of those five decades. Here is what represented the, the uh, 1970s, which gives you an idea of how important this was. Here's the task at hand. Recover wreckage and artifacts from a target object. I say target object. They never said the word submarine out loud. Even within the program, that was not discussed. Weighs approximately 2,000 standard tons, sitting on the ocean floor, 5,100 meters under the ocean. Do it as fast as possible without anyone knowing. You can imagine the RFP that goes out to contractors. Uh, the CIA task force considered a lot of ideas for accomplishing this. I could, I could explain those in, in questions if you want to hear about some of them. What they settled on was something they called grunt lift, which was basically we're going to pick it up in one piece. And after scouring America for a company that could actually do this ridiculous thing, uh, Perangoski picked a relatively new deep sea drilling company called Global Marine. Uh, this guy in particular, Curtis Crook, becomes the, the primary engineer. Crook, in turn, asked his sharpest mind to take the job. This is an MIT, MIT trained naval architect named John Graham. He's the guy who has to create a ship and system to do the tasks that you just saw. Global Marine had built a bunch of incredible ships at this point, including the Cus-1, which started drilling into the seafloor in 1959 with the famous journalist John Steinbeck on board, writing for Life magazine. The Glomar Challenger, which was the first dynamically positioned ship, now this was before GPS, which could hold a position in the open sea, drill a hole in the floor, retract the drill bit, reinsert the drill bit into the same hole. That is what attracted the CIA's attention. Because what you're going to need to do is sit still, drop a very heavy line with some kind of um, grabber, pick it up. Obviously, the ship on the surface can't be moving around at that time. So this is really what gets Global Marine the job. The ship, re the ship required very specific, extremely complicated capabilities, especially because we're talking about early 1970s technology, for instance. A dry, floodable center moon pool. So this is where the claw, the grabber, the artifact being the submarine are going to go. So, um, oh, I forgot to convert to meters. That, the size of the moon pool, 199 feet, 200 feet by 75 feet, basically. I think I've got meters in a later slide. Um, a heavy lift pipe string, which is about 5,100 meters long. That's about three and a quarter miles, which has to hold a capability of 4,250 metric tons. That's the equivalent of eight and a half Boeing 747s. A gimbaled, heave-compensated platform. So the Derrick heavy lick system, pipe string, recovery claw. Um, this has to accommodate roll, pitch, and heave on the ship in various sea states. The ocean does not sit flat ever. And in the remote Pacific, it's actually quite turbulent. Um, and it's going to extend 108 feet above the ship's baseline. A heavy lift system that can pick up a maximum load capacity of 7,000 standard tons. Um, so the heavy lift pipe handling system, I'm going to talk about some of these things in more detail. A docking leg system, because once you get the dynamic load within a certain distance of the ship, you, actually, you obviously have to stabilize that to get it into the bottom of the ship, because this is what happens. The bottom of the ship opens up. Um, and it's dynamically positioned at a time there was no GPS. It has to hold uh, relative to the ocean bottom within a 150-foot radius of 5,100 meters. I should say... At that time, and to this day, no submarine had been salvaged at any depth over 100 meters. 
This is 5,100 meters. This is what the ship plans, this is what they end up. This is the ship, basically. Um, that's the profile, the moon pool. I don't have a um, pointer, do I? No, okay. Basically in the middle, that large, where the X is, that's the moon pool. That's the 200 foot by 75 foot. That's where the object is going to go. Here's the ship at launch. It was built uh, at a shipyard south of Philadelphia on the Delaware River. So fall 1971, submarine sinks in 1968. Operation begins 6970. Obviously the engineering, first they had to figure out how to do it. That takes quite a bit of time. Then the engineering is going to take at least a year. Uh, fall 1971 is when the ship launches. It was really big. So 188 meters long, almost the size of an aircraft carrier. The beam is 35 meters, displaced 45,800 metric tons. The cost, <laughs> who knows? Estimates range from $75 million to $300 million, well over a billion in today's dollars. Again, this is not something the CIA has ever acknowledged. Safe to say it costs a lot. Here's that moon pool in the center that I was talking about. Um, oh, my arrow got moved a little bit. Um, this would hold the capture vehicle, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and the submarine if everything worked. That person for scale, actually he's down just below the arrow. You can see him waving. To give... Oh, oh okay. Is it that one? No. Yeah, no. No? No, we're good. Oh, yes. We got it. That's a guy waving. So that'll give you a sense of the scale of the, this is an open chamber within the center of the ship, which I'm not a naval architect, but if you are or know one, all kinds of issues with stability. The, you know, these wing walls, these are the size of the ship. They're not very thick because you're worried about weight, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of concern about bending and twisting and breaking. Oops, sorry. Um, so audacious engineering was just part of Project Azorian. The CIA couldn't very well send a ship out into, the, like a very large mysterious ship out into the middle of the Pacific, park it there, and expect nobody to notice, especially the Soviets. Well, that's kind of like where we left, lost that submarine, isn't it? Um, they needed a cover story. So, ocean mining. Not an outrageous idea. The mining community in the late 60s and early 70s was already discussing the idea that you could harvest the seafloor for uh, rare earth minerals. In particular, these things, these are called manganese nodules. Um, it's an uh, conglomeration of rare earth min minerals, nickel, cobalt, copper, manganese especially. This is, a, this is actually taken near the submarine, the site of the submarine. They're all literally all over the seafloor. It's really expensive, as you might imagine, to harvest them, also very expensive to process them but not a crazy idea that people were already talking about it. So mining is plausible, people will believe it, but the US government can't just suddenly decide, oh, hey, we're gonna go into the ocean mining business. That also very fishy, nobody would believe it. And most companies big enough to plausibly do this are public. Public companies can't lie to their shareholders in order to pull off a covert operation for the CIA. Problematic in a lot of ways, so you need a private company, you need a private company that can plausibly go into the extremely um, rare, highly, it's very unlikely to be profitable venture of ocean mining. Not many companies fit that bill. However, a guy named Howard Hughes was around. Now, I don't know how well Howard Hughes is known in Europe. Um, the closest analog I can come up with is Elon Musk. Very wealthy, very eccentric a guy who doesn't care what the media thinks of him, who spends lots of money on often eccentric seeming projects. He built the very famous Spruce Goose, the wooden airplane that only flew once and got about 10 feet off the surface of the ocean. Uh, and Howard Hughes was also a big patriot. He'd actually done things for the CIA before. He's basically perfect. You could not have written a better person. I'm not even sure there was another American who could do this. How much was Hughes involved? We don't know, not a lot. He was probably here on the top floor of the Desert Inn. There's a Leonardo DiCaprio movie called The Aviator, which is about Howard Hughes, and late in life he sits in a hotel room with the blinds closed watching his own movies over and over again. This is about what Hughes was doing in the early 1970s, but he had big companies run by very dependable lieutenants. They clearly signed on. So, oops, uh, the, something called the Deep Ocean Mining Project is then formed and born in an office near Los Angeles International Airport. So, 
announcement to the public is Howard Hughes is starting a mining company. It's based in this building. A number of people are hired, including this guy. A former German U-boat crewman, his name is Manfred Krutein. Um, he worked in a Polish shipyard after the war, and when the Soviets invaded Eastern Europe, he fled to the US with a brief stop in Latin America. Um, he named his first son Werner after Werner, uh, Werner von Braun. He also happened to be really interested in ocean mining. There were not a lot of people interested in ocean mining in 1972. This guy was very interested in it. He responds to an ad or he's recruited, I'm not exactly sure. How would you like to start an ocean mining company for Howard Hughes? He's so excited. It's like the thing that never happens. It's like I want to start a space company and someone calls me and asks me to start a space company. Um, he becomes part of the cover operation at first without knowing it. Then, of course, at some point, he's get, he gets briefed and he's kind of bummed. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Uh, the CIA was really good at black ops at this point, uh, but the operations were only as good as their cover. So this was something called the commercial operation division, which is the, the part of the, you've got an engineering portion, accomplish the task, then you've got a cover portion. In this case, the commercial operations division. And it operates a mining company in every way except that they're not actually going mining. So uh, Crutine hires geologists and scientists, also think they're going to work for a mining company. Find out they're not. But you're going to pretend that you are, so you're going to go to conferences and you're going to give talks about our technology, only broad strokes because it's proprietary. You're going to talk about manganese nodules. You're going to go to the UN and talk, uh, argue law of the sea. Like, because what do you think happens when America announces an ocean mining project in the middle of the Pacific? The rest of the world is not happy. Why should America have rights to what's on the seafloor? This has to go to the UN and has to be decided that the US is operating within law. A lot of complications to doing something like this. And that becomes part of this division. So the plan is now in place. Zorian has a ship, which is known to the world as the Hughes Glomar Explorer. It has a convincing cover story. But it wasn't just a ship. The key component was a giant claw at the end of a 5,100 meter pipe, steel pipe string. This piece can't be explained. You're not going to pick up tiny manganese nodules with a giant claw. <laughs> <laughs> they have to build it in secret inside this. This is the world's largest submersible barge, known as the Hughes Mining Barge. This is off Redwood City, just south of San Francisco. It's the size of a small basketball arena built specifically for this job. It's a floating dry dock where, so Lockheed gets the job of building the claw. It's built inside here in secret. Not only is it built inside here in secret, but um, American CIA guys know when the spy satellites are flying over, they start leaving things out on the dock that look like mining equipment. So that if the Soviets ever question, what is this thing? They can say, that's where Howard Hughes is building a secret mining machine, which is literally what they told people. This is what it looked like from the top. It's hard to see in this picture um, but because it's so secret, no photos of the claw were ever released. It became known as Clementine, which is, this is an American folk song, a, a mining song about um, a, a miner's daughter. It's codenamed Clementine because the word claw is verboten. No one in the program can ever use the word claw out loud. It's called recovery vehicle or Clementine. Um, I like to explain it as a giant version of the arcade game where the thing goes down and grabs the teddy bear's head, except this is a two million pound teddy bear. Um, by June of 1974, everything is ready, and the Explorer goes to sea with a crew of engineers, roughnecks, and government employees, mostly CIA, also National Security Agency, a few US Navy people. This is the patch they wore on their uniform. That's one that was given to me by a crew member. One of them drew this. This, is a, this was drawn on the ship from the control room. It's a diagram of the long and complicated process of lowering 5,100 meters of tapered steel pipe to the seafloor in unsteady seas. These are just various benchmarks of how far they were getting. Uh, this pipe, I should say, was also a marvel. It had to be strong enough to hold a two million pound object under tension without breaking. No one on the team knew how to build something that fit those specs. So the CIA calls the Navy, which calls the Army, which brings in the chief metallurgist, a guy who was a specialist in building artillery and warship guns, the only metal they could find that was under similar stresses. So they bring this guy to Washington. They ask him a bunch of questions. He's not cleared into the project, so he has no idea what he's talking about. He's just advising on steel diameters and widths and, and um, various types of steel. Then he goes back to his job. He only finds out decades later what they were even asking him about. 
Honestly, every system on board the Glomar Explorer is a marvel. Um, this is how the, the crew assembled the 285 individual 16 meter long, 18 metric ton pipe sections from a horizontal, horizontal storage, which is, ah, sorry, here. So they're stored horizontally. Um, they're lifted and put onto this um, elevator where they go up to the derrick. They're lifted up, jammed down, the mail is jammed down into the um, existing portion of the string already. Um, this is 30 and a half meters above the main deck of the ship. This, by the way, has to be done on a ship that's rolling plus or minus eight degrees, pitching plus or minus five degrees, heaving plus or minus seven and a half feet relative to the ship. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is done um, at a design speed of five, five and a half meters a minute, applying a minimum 50,000 foot-pounds of torque to the pipe tool joint. They had to build the world's largest wrench, essentially, to tighten the joint. But it tightened, I think, two and a half rotations. It had to do this every 200 seconds, and then again in reverse on the round trip, and you couldn't kill anybody. <laughs> the pipe under tension was very dangerous. It's why John Graham designed the ship to be gimbaled. It floated on bearings in order to keep it steady relative to the um, bucking of the ship. It was also heave compensated. The pipe could not, under any circumstances, hit the side of the ship. A lot of people believed that if that happened under tension, the ship would break in half and everyone would die. Here are the bearings from the platform. No company in the United States could build these bearings. They were the largest bearings ever built and maybe still are. Who built them? Germany's FAG, or FAG, I'm not sure how you pronounce. Yeah, is it FAG? Is it? Yeah, okay. Um, these are built in Germany. Of course, the company that built them didn't know what they were for. Um, we think they may still be the biggest. The work on board was very stressful for everyone, weather's an issue, complicated systems that were never tested, constant maintenance and workarounds. So the guys who designed every system had the engineers who designed it on board to operate them, and that came in handy because things broke a lot. Um, only some things had been tested in advance because of time and logistics. It was also stressful because of these guys. These are Soviets. Um, so while the explorer is sitting there, it wasn't just left alone. The Soviet Navy diverts ships to the site on more than one occasion. So first it's a Soviet tug, after that comes a missile tracking ship. These, by the way, were taken by crew members from the Glomar Explorer. This was diverted from its job of monitoring um, ballistic missile testing. We now know from intercepts that the Soviets believed the story, and the reason they eventually went away was because they decided to be annoying for a while, and they were. They harassed the Explorer, including when the pipe was under tension. They were actually just like circling around being really annoying. The captain worried at one point that he was gonna be rammed. They sent a helicopter over the top to take pictures, so the moon pool was covered. Obviously, that was the other thing that could give it away. You couldn't see down into the middle of the ship. This is, again, taken by a crewman. But eventually, the Soviets go away. Here's what a 1974 control room looks like with some of the earliest possible computers. Specifically, this is the control panel for the automatic station keeping system. Transducers on the hull pinged seafloor hydrophones, five 1,750 horsepower side thrusters and two 6,600 horsepower fixed pitch main propellers adjusted the ship very subtly to keep it in position um, within 12 meters to a point more than 5,000 meters below in up to 5.5 meter swells and 40 knot winds. If you're curious about the computing power, it had six Honeywell computers with 30, 32 kilobytes each. Also some peripherals including magnetic tape, alphanumeric CRT displays, card readers, plotters, and printers. Here's what all that trouble is worth. This is a still from the cameras on the capture vehicle, Clementine. So there was real-time telemetry delivered to the control room. I mean, it, it took a few, I say real-time, it took a few seconds, I can't remember exactly how many seconds. But on Clementine, on the claw, you had long-range sonar, high-resolution sonar, altitude-attitude sonar, 12 television cameras lit by 26 lights, Every system was redundant. Here are the telemetry cables. That's my hand. I'm holding a cross section. Of, these were built by Lockheed, the same place they built the Corona spy satellite. Um, that's how big they are. There were two of them, so everything was redundant. Here's a closer look at what those cameras saw. This is the sail of the submarine. Another one, that's the submarine listed on its side. It wasn't sitting up and down, and it wasn't sitting completely on its side. It was at an angle. Another one. Oh, oh, yes. Sorry. 
Another one. Aha. There were surprises on the, the feed sometimes. This is a rat tail fish. Um, it's blind, so the lights wouldn't have bothered it. Uh, very few, if any, humans at that time had ever seen one of these on a camera because there was no um, craft capable of reaching this point. Obviously, the Trieste got to the bottom of the Mariana Trench one time. It didn't have cameras, so we only know what, what Don Walsh and Jacques Picard saw. So probably this is the first time a rat tail fish had ever been on camera. Also, surprise, so this is a hammer. Um, this crack was being, was, had been identified on the photographs taken by the halibut a year, or whatever, three years before. They were gonna use this as a calibration point for, so they're flying the claw around, basically. It's got thrusters at all four ends. And they were gonna use this to calibrate the position of Clementine. When they do that, they're like, wait, that looks like one of our hammers. So what happened is at some point in the preparation, some guy on the crew dropped his hammer through the moon pool, and it fell 5,000 meters down and landed on the submarine. This is what they really wanted. Um, that is an intact SSN-5 submarine-launched ballistic missile. This is the cap in the missile tube. So the submarine had three of them. One of them fell out. One of them was destroyed in some way, unclear exactly what happened. One was completely intact. So the, the main things that the US wanted were this missile and the cryptological equipment inside. There are a lot of other things they would have wanted, which I can talk about later if you want. But this is the main target, the opportunity to get your hands on an intact Soviet ballistic missile, which obviously there's a million things you can learn from that. We would know some guidance from having the, the, the warheads I talked about earlier, but also we didn't know how they detonated them, what their fissile material was made up of. So basically a priceless object. So when I say it cost a billion dollars, that would have been highly worth it if you could get this. So did it work? Kind of. <laughs> Uh, the ship and its systems, which had never been fully tested, like I said, for time and logistical reasons, did the very specific thing that it was supposed to do. It picked up a 907,000 kilogram object, a submarine, without anyone knowing it had done that. But there's a but. Many hours into the lift and 1,500 meters off the ocean floor, one of the steel fingers on the claw snaps under tension. Debated to this day what happened, basically Global Marine thinks that Lockheed chose the wrong metal. High, very strong, but very brittle. Under extreme tension, it snapped. So a portion of the submarine falls back to the seafloor. Not the entire thing. Unfortunately, the part that fell back was the part with the missile. <laughs> the part with the crypto gear. So a chunk of it comes up, but it's not the chunk. So then you can argue, was the billion dollars worth it? Maybe not, because you didn't get those parts. And at this point, the Glomar Explorer, which had been harassed by Soviet ships for a month, has no choice but to go back to Hawaii. Let's take a look at what we've got. This is off of Lahaina in Hawaii on its return. Um, the crew did something else important there. So um, body parts, I mean, they had prepared for everything. They knew there would be submariners or parts of submariners or something on board. They'd enlisted a Soviet director, defector to write a funeral ceremony. They studied Soviet burial at sea. So off of Lahaina, they hold this ceremony for the portions of the crew members. Now, I don't know how many or exactly what state they were in, but, but they had Soviet ensigns, they had coffins, they hold a ceremony. You can actually watch it on YouTube. It's someone at some point has now uploaded it, so um, if you're curious later and wanna see an American ship holding a Soviet naval burial at sea ceremony, you can. So that video was filmed because it was taken, we just knew if it was ever leaked, so that's one of the main concerns the Soviets would have. Like, how did you treat our, our, our guys? Very well thought out. In 1992, when the wall falls, Robert Gates, later um, defense secretary, but at that time, director of the CIA goes to Moscow. One of the things he does is take a copy of the funeral and the bell from the K-129. This is a piece of the K-129. Two Nines Hall, which I saw in the home of a retired CIA officer in California. He wouldn't give it to me. He did give me that patch, though. And he gave me my, I have my own manganese nodule, which is mounted in glass. I didn't bring this, sorry. Um, intelligence people will debate forever whether Project Azorian was worth it, but there's no argument over the greatness of the ship and its engineering. And you know, take my word for it, these guys agreed. In 2006, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers names the Glomar Explorer a landmark alongside the Apollo lander. Um, the CIA actually planned to go back and get the rest of the submarine. I, the cover story held so well that they began a follow-up operation called Project Matador. They redesigned the claw using different steel. 
Unfortunately, the story leaks at this point. Um, it, it leaks and the LA Times runs a, a factually inaccurate version of a story about America trying to steal a submarine from the Russians. It only runs one day and is full of errors. The CIA gambles that something happened in World War II when America cracked the Japanese purple code, that was also leaked to the media and then quickly squashed and the Japanese either saw it and didn't believe it or never saw it. So the CIA thinks maybe we can do that again. Director of the CIA goes to the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, everybody and says basically, I know you saw that thing that was in the Los Angeles Times. I want you to not follow up on it. Like, the stakes here are extremely high. We're, this is, could be considered an act of war, what we're doing. And if you do this, you're putting all Americans at risk. They all agree. He, Colby, uh, William Colby, the director of the CIA, writes down all the people who make this agreement, and he keep, folds it up and puts it in his wallet and says, if I ever get word that this is going to leak, I promise to personally call you all and say you can go ahead. So, of course, what all these papers do is they, they, they don't call off their reporting. They continue reporting the story, just waiting for the time at which they can use it. Well, this guy doesn't listen to William Colby. He's a radio personality, kind of a maverick, Jack Anderson. He goes on the radio and says, you know what, it's true what you saw, or what you may have heard. America did do this, and they spent all kinds of your taxpayer money. It's outrageous. So Colby calls all those people. The next day, it's everywhere. These are stories that had been reported over time. They were pretty highly detailed and accurate. At that point, Colby actually confirms facts. So now, everything's gone. You can't go back at that point. The Soviets began to closely monitor the site. We were never gonna be able to go back, at least not on the surface. With Colby's bl blessing, all the stories come out. Now the US government has this incredibly complicated, very specific ship, and they don't, have no idea what to do with it. John Wayne, here, famous actor John Wayne is really worried about it. He writes a letter to President Gerald Ford saying, I hear you're thinking of scrapping that thing. Like, that would be such a tragedy. We need to find a use for it. The CIA tells Global Marine, that's your job. Like, what do you want to do with this thing? They hired, um, there used to be a show called The Six Million Dollar Man starring Richard Anderson. They hired Richard Anderson. They filmed this promotional video where he flies out to the Global Marine Explorer and takes you on a tour, basically looking for someone who wants to use this thing. For a time, Lockheed tried to really mine with it. They, they did create a prototype mining program. They built a mining tool, a real mining tool, not a mining tool, um, built on an Archimedes screw, and it just was never going to be economically feasible. Um, so there's Sean Wayne. So probably the most famous legacy of Project Azorian is this. Americans all recognize it. I don't know how well this phrase is, is known in Europe. Um, neither confirm nor deny. Have you heard this before? This is something that PR agencies and federal agencies in the United States tell to reporters and reporters find very frustrating. It's, very, it's basically like I'm not gonna say anything to you, but it's not a no comment. And the reason this is created is because when the story leaks to the media, obviously people see it for reasons that are not entirely clear, but I think have to do with back channel negotiations between America and the Soviet Union. This is really embarrassing for the Soviets. We learned a lesson from the, the U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia, paraded on television. Um, the mistake that Eisenhower made is that he went on television and admitted what he was doing. He said, that was a spy plane. We were overflying the Soviet Union for three years. They couldn't shoot it down. This was really embarrassing. Khrushchev almost started a war over it. So what we know is they're very sensitive to being embarrassed publicly. This thing is leaked. It's obviously public, but if you're a citizen of the Soviet Union, it, you're not reading the New York Times in 1974, 75. So I think what happened is that the Soviet Union said to the CIA, like, okay, you did that thing, and we're pissed, and let's figure out how not to go to war, but also you got to not talk about it. And not just now, never. Like, this did not happen. So despite the story being leaked to the media, starting in 1975 and proceeding until 2011, the Soviet Union, I mean, sorry, the CIA never officially acknowledges that this happened, and not only that, it has to come up with a way to explain it. When journalists call up and say, I saw the pap that thing in the um, paper, I'm filing a freedom of information request for your files about Project Azorian, the CIA has to come up with a way to answer that. So their legal counsel goes to a specific lawyer who worked on this program and says, I'm bound by law to respond to a freedom of information request. I either have to say, here it is with redactions, or I can't give it to you for national security reasons. The problem with saying the second part is that it admits that it actually happened. If I say, yeah, I've got those, but I can't give them to you, I'm saying I, it did happen, I just can't talk about it. So we need a third way. What do we say? This little bit of legalese is what the lawyer came up with. 
This is challenged in federal court and it holds up. It's now known as the Glomar rule or the Glomar exemption because the Glomar Explorer, very famous, always challenged in court, used all the time. Now, such a cliche that in 2014 when the CIA launched its Twitter account, the Public Affairs Office debated what the first tweet in CIA history should be. It went all the way up to the director of the CIA, William Brennan, here's what they went with. We can neither confirm nor deny that this is our first tweet. <laughs> Tells you a little something. I was a little late. In 2015, when I was reporting it, the Hughes Glomar Explorer was scrapped in Asia. So actually, it was used for a long time as an actual mining, or not actual, actual drill ship. So they took the claw and all that stuff off, but the pipe string became part of a, a, a drill ship. In 2015, it was scrapped. I never got to see it. The claw was scrapped right after the operation. The only major part of Azorian that's still around is the giant mining barge. So that HMB1, that Hughes mining barge, that's the real name. So this is now a floating dry dock in Alameda, California, across from San Francisco. It's still there and probably will be for a long time. One of the naval architects on the program tipped me off to another piece that was still around. So these are the sea gates. So on the bottom of the ship, when it opened up, enclosed in order to, to drop the claw down and bring the submarine up. Each of those gates was enormous. Well, this is how big they are. Um, they are still in use. This is in Portland, Oregon. Also now have been re reused as a floating dry dock. Um, Curtis Crook, the, the global marine chief engineer on the project, now in his 90s, when I visited him, he asked me, he said he wonders about the bearings. And he thinks maybe they are in use on the SpaceX gimbaled platform for the SpaceX rockets being landed off of Cape Canaveral. This is a very blurry picture, sorry about that. Uh, he can't confirm it. SpaceX wouldn't confirm it or didn't know, actually, or, or, or maybe couldn't be bothered to address it. Um, so there's a chance. And that would be the, the one piece of German technology on board, perhaps still in use. Um, and that's the story of this Project Azorian, and my book, which I wrote, uh, was published a year and a half ago, was based heavily on interviews with participants, but also when I mentioned the CIA, I didn't talk about it. Between 1975 and 2011, they said nothing. No acknowledgement, no comment, nothing. Uh, in 2011, uh, a group of journalists were able to use the um, freedom of information request to get the official, so the CIA, I didn't know this, but I guess makes sense, writes official histories of all its projects. Those are classified. Sometimes they're released much later. These journalists get the official um, his internal history released. So it was released in 2011 with heavy redactions, but it was an invaluable tool for like weights and sizes and dates and, and titles. And then I filled it in by going out and finding people who took place. Some CIA officers, though they were pretty um, close-lipped still, especially contractors. I mean, they were never cleared to talk about this, but most of them were in their 80s, some of them in their 90s, staying in retirement homes, and their, their position was like, if they're going to come and arrest me now, that's going to be really bad publicity. <laughs> in fact, you know, not only did the CIA not get upset about it, last October they invited me to come give a version of this talk at CIA headquarters in Langley. So they're proud of it, and, and I think for a lot of reasons, I think they would have loved to talk about it between, despite the failure, which was a such a fluky failure of, of metallurgy and not even of really engineering. I think they would have loved to rub the Soviets' faces in this. And, and when you read some of the retirement statements from Soviet admirals and people in fleet intelligence, they were in awe of this. That like, you will see them comment, say things like, "We always suspected suspected there was something fishy about this ship." But we thought there was no way the Americans can do that. Like I said, no one had ever salvaged a submarine below a few hundred feet. This was three plus miles down. It just seemed impossible to them. You know, co complexity wise, like we're talking moon landing almost at that time. We still don't have this capability. We're just now getting back to these depths in the oceans. There are only six submarines on the planet that can get below 6,000 meters, submersibles. The, the deep sea remains a, a massive um, black hole, really. I mean, we, the, our sea maps are not very accurate. So it was just so stunning to the Soviets, and I think the CIA loved to brag about it. So now they can, and they kind of are. I, I follow their Twitter account now, and they have tweet, tweeted about Project Azorian many times. And just in the way that they, they tweet about or they brag about the Blackbird or certain other programs, Corona Spy Satellite. And I think they're very proud of 
the fact that they did these things and not the Air Force or the Navy. And interestingly, you know, especially for a technical crowd, the reason it, these things went to the CIA is it's not to say that the Navy and the Air Force can't do these things, but the F-35 first flew its prototype flight in, I think, 2002. It went operational this year. The SR-71 Blackbird took, okay, a little bit over two years to create and fly the fastest airplane in history to this day. The U-2 took eight months. So I think the Air Force could build the U-2. It would just take 12 years. And they wouldn't do it in secret because they'd put out an RFP and there'd be 20 companies bidding on it. And so that's the reason the CIA operated like the startup. And the, and the Directorate of Science and Technology was essentially a startup within the CIA that purpose-built technology and still does to this day. So you think of the CIA making like little spy cameras or you know, the drone program, um, the Predator Project, you know, the first autonomous airplanes were created at the CIA. Um, and then more outlandish things, like um, they tried to, to turn a cat into a um, spy platform at one point. They literally sewed cameras, oh, I'm sorry, listening devices into a cat and tried to train it to sit at known Soviet drop points. <laughs> they did create one and it's called Acoustic Kitty. What happened during the first field test? It ran out into traffic and got hit. <laughs> the program was killed. <laughs> or there's a Netflix show called Wormwood, which is about like the, the, some of the LSD projects. There's a lot of insane stories from the CIA. Some of them are incredible and worthy of attention, and some of them are extreme wastes of taxpayer money. You know, we can debate whether this was a good um, expenditure of money, but from an engineering perspective and a cover, to cover story perspective, like you kind of have to say, this part was amazing and this part was amazing. The world for four years believed Howard Hughes was mining the ocean. That's pretty remarkable. So um, there is a lot to the story I didn't cover. I'm happy to answer questions. That's, uh, that's sort of the flyover of 1968 to 1974. Thank you, Josh, for that very interesting and entertaining <laughs> talk. Um, so my privilege to have the first question, I guess, while Jan is looking for others. Um, so I'm just, uh, so there's one twist in the story that I like very much. You may not Oops, know, um, but <laughs> our company's acronym, the TNG, uh, in German you can say, uh, testen not glauben, uh, nicht glauben, um, uh, which means you should uh, rather test everything and not believe stuff. Um, but uh, so the twist is um, it broke eventually because, I mean, it's a great feat and they didn't test anything, right? So they assembled it on site and they did everything there and they hoped for the best, right? And, and they spent a billion dollars on it. So um, finally it snapped and that's kind of uh, calming to uh, the audience also <laughs> because we have software engineers and they're always told to uh, test everything, right? So we spend a lot of time and money in that. So that's a good part of the message. Um, Right. <laughs> yeah, well, can I comment? I can let me comment on that. But do you have a question about that or different? No, no, you oh. can go ahead. So, yeah, the breaking of the claw, this is a bone of contention to this day between Global Marine and Lockheed. Global Marine was, was given supervisory authority. They were the primary engineers, and they did not get to design the claw, nor did they really weigh in on it. They, they say that as deep sea drilling company, they never would have made a mistake with the steel, and that Lockheed had... Lockheed consulted them about that, or the CIA set it up in a way that they, I guess at some point somebody missed the fact that we should all be talking about this. It was so compartmentalized that the wrong steel was clearly chosen. The other thing is that, yeah, you mentioned the testing. It was just impossible to do that. How could you? You're certainly, among the things you're worried about is that if something breaks, you don't have time to go back. But probability-wise, when the program launched, it had a 10 to 20% launch. Uh, 10 to 20% chance of success. These were the internal Pentagon estimates. When they left Long Beach to do the mission, it was hovering around 40 or 50%. So they knew there was a really good chance it wasn't gonna work. So you can imagine the elation and then the deflation when it works, everything works. The Soviets come, like the cover story works and then it breaks. So yeah, it's something that the engineers are fighting about still. Like the global marine guys are still mad at Lockheed about that. <laughs> Yeah, so perfectly, you answered my question. Okay. <laughs> the implicit question was, what, what, what was their assessment on the chances? Yeah, so. yeah, I'm not a metallurgist and I can't remember. Um, they used HY100, I think. I mean, the, the explanation was basically that it was an extremely strong but an extremely brittle steel and that that was the wrong steel. Okay. 
So we have a question, I believe. Yes, so uh, thank you for this very exciting story. Um, was it known by the time, or could it be determined later, why the submarine sank in the first place? Good question. The most common question that I can't answer. Um, there are a lot of theories about what happened. If the US government knows, it has never been declassified. The Russians, I think, don't know. The explanation is that some sort of accident happened during probably, well, okay, I should say, if you ask a Russian, they will tell you that what happened is a US Navy sub accidentally collided with it during a, a common, this was very common that we trailed each other's submarines, and sometimes what happens is that the, the Russian or American submarine that's being, well, or that thinks it might be being trailed makes erratic maneuvers in order to clear its blind spot, so it might just suddenly turn, and then it's not crazy to think that a submarine could hit the sail. This is what the Russians think, that that's where the hole in the hole comes from that causes it to sink. This is denied by the U.S. Navy vehemently to this day. Uh, what, what the Navy says, or, well, what people in the public have guessed using publicly available data. And you can find the, the acoustic data from the sensors is available. So the former chief acoustic analyst for the Navy has looked at it. What he says is that the, so the, the submarine was probably surfacing for a missile test in which it would go through all the procedures it would go through to fire a missile. And that at some point during that test, there was an accident and a fire broke out in one of the tubes. The missile, and, and he, this is very complicated. I'm not sure I even totally understand it, but he figured out what the duration of the fuel burn would be for each missile, and that's how long the sound lasts. So he thinks that one of the missiles caught fire, burned. It didn't detonate because there's so many safety mechanisms built into a warhead. It, it, it can only detonate in one way, and we know this because you know, the United States once accidentally dropped a hydrogen bomb on Spain. It fell and bounced off of a farmer's field. We've dropped a bomb on Pennsylvania once. Like, these things are designed not to blow up unless you want them to blow up. So this is plausible, and that's what he says. The Soviets, like I said, believe that it was an accident. This is denied. Is it possible that we've been lying about that? It's certainly possible. My problem with it is that if, if that's what happened, it means the Navy didn't tell the CIA that. They just said, here's where the submarine is, and here's how we found it. Because if that was the reason, I don't think the CIA would have been comfortable going forward. Like if, if it's our fault and we sank it and then we went and tried to steal it, that's definitely gonna start a war. So the Navy would have to lie to, an, uh, is that completely impossible? It's certainly not. But I think the most plausible explanation is the, the accident during the missile test fire. Um, and this guy, very esteemed analyst, his, his, his um, explanation's on the internet too. His name's Bruce Rule. And uh, he basically argues for why he thinks that's the case. So ba to say what, a fire breaks out, breaches the hull, submarine sinks, fills with water. This would also explain why it was fairly intact, because a, usually a submarine exceeds its crush depth and implodes catastrophically. There would be nothing left to recover. That didn't happen in this case, which means it filled with water. So the hull breached up near the surface, well, between surface and crush depth, which was 500 meters or so. Um, this would explain that. Who or what gave you the motivation to investigate this story? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was like an intelligence legend that I'd been aware of. For, you know, when I said it, it leaked in the media, so it's not like no one knew about it. But over time, the, the story was kind of fading away. Periodically, you would hear something about this Project Azorian, and I was just aware of it. And I mean, I wish I had a more exciting story than I was looking for a book, and I was very interested in intelligence at the time, and it just sort of popped into my head, and I thought, like, had anyone ever really done that? And there had been a few, there's one very technical book done by a Navy guy. There was a quasi-memoir done by a participant in the operation that's kind of a mess, and I just felt like the combination of what was publicly available and what I thought I could find out. So I went and started reporting to see, you know, I knew it wouldn't work unless I could talk to real guys on board. I mean, that's what I do as a journalist. Like, I'm not just gonna write a book based on the technical data that's available, I need the human stories. And, a lot of what this book is the human stories, the guys who did it. So I reached out to a few of them and found they were willing to talk and it just sort of went from there. And, and, and what tends to happen is that, you know, you talk to one guy and you build his trust, then he says, well, you should call my friend. Here's a guy that might talk to you. And sometimes they say yes and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they say, maybe, why don't you come have a conversation with me? Which I know means they're gonna talk to me. Nope. <laughs> 
you know, one thing you learn as a journalist is that everybody loves to tell their, their own story. Like, no matter who they are, if I sit across from you and start asking you what you do in a very interested way, you're probably going to tell me your story. And, like, a guy who's been keeping the secret, and I, there's one great example. I went to this retirement home in Massachusetts, and a guy who had been very senior at the Pentagon, he, he founded, maybe some of you have heard of the National Reconnaissance Office, which is basically extremely secretive U.S. office that runs overhead surveillance, spy satellites. It has an equivalent called the National Underwater Reconnaissance Office, which was launched for this project, and then later um, oversaw something called Ivy Bells, which was a famous U.S., um, we tapped a cable in the Sea of Okhotsk, invented saturation diving in order to take the tape out of this tap. So this office within the Pentagon, extremely secretive. This is the guy that founded it, and when I reached out to him, he, he was one of those ones who said, why don't you come see me and let's talk about it. And by the end of it, he was so excited, and he was like, now I'm going to tell everybody at dinner tonight. And I was like, this is a guy who literally ran one of the sec most secret offices at the Pentagon. He's not talked for 40 years, and he was just like, he felt so liberated, you know. So those kind of guys made it possible. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, assuming today the Soviets would lose again a submarine, would you say it's easier or harder to cover it up these days? I don't think you could do this today. I, I think with, it's such an easy excuse, social media and cameras on everything, but I think honestly with social media and cameras on everything, like I just think it's very hard to pull off a secret of this scale. I think the CIA and agencies within every government are pulling off secret things all the time. But I think you could not do something of this scale. I just, there were thousands of people cleared into this. None of them leaked, or if they did, you know, those leaks were squashed very quickly. But I think it's just inconceivable to think that there wouldn't be people. You know, I, one of the things that would be happening, I think, is like, for instance, the, um, the barge floating south of Redwood City. Like, there would be open source photographs of that, and you know people would obsess about it on the internet. And when you've got people watching a site every day using satellite data, they're going to pick up on things that, you know, start to become mysterious and they start asking questions. And I just think it would leak. And I think people would probably look at the Glomar Explorer. Again, what people didn't have was high-resolution photography of the Glomar Explorer from every angle to break down and analyze. They had some grainy pictures taken from a bridge, which, okay, it looks like a mining ship. And actually, there's a funny story from Curtis Crook, the, the global, global marine engineer, in one of the court cases that resulted, you know, and I explained journalists start suing for information and they come up with a neither confirm nor deny. In one of those court cases, you know, somebody asked Curtis Crook about, you know, how comfortable he was with the lie. And he, he said it was perfect. I can go out there and tell you it's a mining ship because there is no such thing as a mining ship. Like, anything I say is plausible because there is no such thing, right? Like, who are you to say that that's not a mining ship? What are you comparing it to? So it was kind of perfect, and I just feel like, how, how could you do that today? There are millions of people out there dying to pick apart this weird mining ship. Like, it wouldn't work, I don't think. Uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. So y you told us that the Soviets were actually harassing the emission, but that they still bought the cover story. So I can't help but wonder, uh, didn't they know where their sub had sank, not even approximately, or were they just assuming it was impossible to recover? We know that they didn't know where it was with any specificity because the massive search they launched was pretty inaccurate. And I think the explanation for that is that it's, going, it's running silent for a number of days, and they probably know about where it is approximately. But approximately is a really big approximately out in the middle of the Pacific. You know, they say, like, you know, needle in a haystack doesn't even begin to explain what we're talking about here. It's like a needle in a thousand haystacks. So I think they looked in the wrong place. They were suspicious enough to go and harass it, but not so sure of the location. And this is how good the cover story was, that you know, they're listening, you know, we're, we're intercepting their communications and they're talking about Howard Hughes. So they really did believe that because the CIA spent three years selling the lie. Like I said, people are going to conferences and going to the UN. They, they built it and built it and built it for years. So even there is one guy within Soviet intelligence who swears that he knew, you know, there's always one guy. And maybe he's right, maybe he did, but when he goes up the food chain to the Kremlin, all of the bigwigs are saying, no way, that, that is impossible. The Americans could not do that. No one could do that. We wouldn't even know how to begin to go about it. So I think it was a combination of not knowing with any accuracy where it was, and also just the cover story being that effective, that honestly, that, yeah. We, in, it wasn't just that they went away, we actually heard what they were saying, and they were saying, it's Howard Hughes' ship. 
They were very annoying, though. They were definitely harassing. You know, and the harassment was was fairly dangerous at one point. Like I said, they were like they would like cruise at it full speed and then turn. And the captain of the Glomar Explorer could not do anything because once the pipe was under tension, he cannot move the ship. The ship is is going to stay dynamically positioned, and so he can't mount an evasive maneuver. Which is what he's saying to the Soviet captain is. We're doing mining tests, and I've got something under tension. I don't know how exactly he said it, but what you're doing, you might cause the ship to sink, and then you're going to cause an international incident, and you're starting a war. The only thing they were worried about was if the Soviets had put divers in the water. So when the sub comes up within a certain distance of the ship, if they'd thrown divers in the water, then, then you can't explain it. But not many divers are going to be excited about that. It's a pretty dangerous job under two moving ships with some kind of machinery happening underneath to be the diver who's like, go figure out what they're doing. Anyone else? Okay. Josh, um, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, and I think there are lots of open questions. And uh, <laughs> I don't are. know, will people get the chance to ask you afterwards? Are you still sticking sure. around a bit? Yeah. Okay, great, then you can ask unofficial questions like, um, did the CIA, um, well, the old operatives, did they contact you unofficially and, and thank you for the report on it? Uh, they don't have to sit at home anymore with smug faces. <laughs> right, so thank you very much okay. uh, for the presentation and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, thanks for having me.